Welcome to the Cut for Time podcast here at the Canton United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Clay. I'm joined by Eric Stearns. And today we're digging into my message from Sunday, which was all about love, but not the love we normally think of. When we think about love, it's about service love, agape love, God's love. And how that is shown through the life of the church um, and how uh, Paul was telling the Corinthians to just cool it with some of their divisions, then overcoming those divisions with love. So let's get into it. Sounds good. Yeah. So we had talked about this, I believe, a little bit on the last podcast. We had talked about how this scripture is always used during a wedding. Yes. And how this is not necessarily the most fitting application of this scripture. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about that some more? Yeah, sure. So I do not fault couples for picking 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I'm actually planning this worship series right now with my friend, Pastor Steph uh, Schneider. And she had a wedding on Saturday. And the couple was not very church, didn't have a lot of background in scripture, but they knew 1 Corinthians 13. And so Steph actually had to preach this scripture twice, once at a wedding on Saturday, and then once on Sunday morning. Again, I don't fault couples for picking 1 Corinthians 13. It does make sense that, you know, we're talking about a lot about love and what love is and what love does and how love functions and what better space to talk about that during a wedding. But the thing that we always have to keep in mind is that Paul is not talking about romantic love. And so when couples do choose this, I'm, I'm the one that's always telling them, hey, that's great. This is about love, but it's not like romantic love. It's not like the love that we're automatically here for. This is about something so much bigger. Mm-hmm. Paul says in the very end of chapter 12, I will show you the more excellent way. And the more excellent way is love. And so then as I'm preaching that at a wedding, what I do is I kind of unpack some of those pieces um, and then in the life of what I know about the couple. Um, But like, it's so much bigger than just a wedding event. It's so much bigger than just this day. Yes, this type of love is important in a marriage, but like the other parts of love come in too. The romantic kind of part of love comes into this relationship very, you know, clearly, you Mm -hmm. know, so I always just have to temper it a little bit. And to, to make it, to make us remember that, first of all, I'm talking to this married couple, this, this couple is getting married and like they're about to have a life together. There's this, the wedding is going to be a memory in mere minutes. Mm-hmm. But the rest of life, this is the kind of love that you are going to show to one another from here on out. And not just one another, everyone you interact with. Right. Yeah. Without, <clears throat> well, we've been married to our spouses for to us, feels like a while. Other people might think not think it's that long. But right. without this kind of love, without... How many years, though, just so, so, yes. just so the listeners know? We will be coming on 10 here in May. And nice. how many for you? We will be coming up on 12 in June. Very good. So, so yeah. It's been a little while. Uh-huh. And without this kind of love, without the love that God intends for us to share with everyone, if we don't share that with our spouse, right? our wedding or our marriage really doesn't work. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. You know, we sure. don't if we don't treat our wives as an equal where our our gifts work together with each other to make this one unit go. Mm-hmm. You know, if one of us thinks we're better than the other or anything like that, it just it doesn't work. Everything falls apart. Yes. Absolutely. And so even yeah, and I agree that, you know, this isn't the romantic love, but without this, mm-hmm. our marriage is just yeah, it's just garbage. Right. One of the lines that was in the sermon on Sunday is that faith without love is cold and hope without love is dim like Mm -hmm. this love matters a great deal in all life especially in marriage but in all of life okay so if you don't typically like to see people just on a rabbit trail because it's a podcast and we can do this (laughs) Uh, (laughs) since you since you since first corinthians 13 isn't necessarily your first choice for a wedding Right. What is your first choice for a wedding? Yeah, so my <laughs> first choice for a wedding, um, not, and it's not just because it was what Lindsay and I used a long time ago, uh, but my, my really my first choice is Ecclesiastes, uh, where it talks about how the, the, the benefits of companionship. Mm. A two-strand uh, two cord is pretty strong, but a, a three-strand cord cannot be broken. And so we talk, as the, that's an, a nice jumping-off point to talk about the fact that you're going to weave the love of God throughout your marriage. And the, 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 when, when you feel like you're going to snap, when you, feel like you're, when you feel like the two of you might be tenuous, 
you have this third strand to hold on to. Mm-hmm. And the third strand is what keeps us strong in those moments when we just feel about everything in general. But, you know, I really like to preach on the third strand, um, not just because, like I said, not just because it was at our wedding, but I just think it's a very important text. Um, I've also preached out of Ruth, where Ruth and Naomi say to one another, or where Ruth says to Naomi, uh, where you'll go, I'll go, where I'll stay, you'll stay. You know, you'll pe- your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Um, I think that's a really deep text. Um, theirs is not a romantic relationship either, mm-hmm. so it's a little bit kind of the same problem as First Corinthians. But, you know... It just so encapsulates the nature of the relationship that you're forming in a marriage and the nature of, of your relationship with God, that wherever we go, we are God's people. And wherever we go, you are the person that you, you know, you're, you're the person for the person that you married. And so those are two texts I really like to preach at weddings. Sure. And what it really comes down to is our marriage is so much more than the romantic part of things. Oh, yes, you know? for sure. You know, and it, <clears throat> we don't... Maybe when you're first, that maybe takes a front seat when, when you first get married. Right, yeah. Yep. But that, as you grow and as you change, mm-hmm. you've got to have that companionship. You've got yes. to have that willingness to to always be by that person's side, even mm-hmm. when it's not that much fun. Yeah, for sure. And show them the, the love that God intends for us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's cool. Because First Corinthians isn't that, but it is very important, when are they the right words? Mm-hmm. And so Paul gives the church these words in the context of spiritual gifts. Um, First Corinthians 12 is all about, you know, our spiritual gifts and our interdependence upon one another's spiritual gifts. Um, like, I know what my spiritual gifts are, and like, by the grace of God, I know what they are not. And like, I know that I have people around me in this church that have the gifts that I don't. Mm-hmm. Like, I know finances are important. I know it's important because of the of the spiritual side of it, but like the business side of it, <laughs> sure. I have a degree in theology and philosophy and an MDiv. There's not a lot that I have in that background, but I know that I have smart people that I can trust that have that gift, that have that skill, that have that passion and that interest. Sure, and that's awesome. Like that's how it's supposed to work that i know what my skills are and you know what your skills are and we work together that's not what's happening in corinth what's happening in corinth is that they're seeing their differences and then they start to make some people feel less than because they don't have the same skill set that another person has Mm -hmm. so so what are those differences? Like, what was happening? Yeah, so um, one of the things that was happening um, is that those that had more charismatic gifts, um, those that had the gifts of prophecy, those that had the gift of tongues, basically, the, the glossolalia that is the, the very fancy theological mm. word for it, uh, when, you're, when you're seeming to speak gibberish, but you're speaking a spirit, some kind of spiritual language, it's called glossolalia, and those that had this more performative gift um, were seen as better than those that had more behind the scenes gifts, the gifts of, you know, of, of teaching and the, and the gifts of, you know, things that still needed to get done in the life of the church. And rather than seeing those as complementary, mm-hmm. they started to see them as exclusive, as we are the better ones because we have these gifts you only have those gifts, and oh, that's, that's just too bad for you. And Paul says, uh, enough of that, <laughs> basically. Mm-hmm. And Paul gives to the church and to us the image of the body of Christ. And when that works all together, we are the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. And what could be better than that? And then, you know, <laughs> put these divisions away and strive for greater gifts, the greater gifts of faith and hope and love. And as he says at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, the most important one of those is love. The Mm -hmm. greatest of these is love. So that's kind of that's kind of what's happening. And like it's easy to look at that and say, oh man, the silly Corinthians are doing silly Corinthian things again, but there's still a little bit of that, a little bit of that in our world today, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and like maybe it's not as stark as it was in Corinth, but it's still definitely a thing that happens. Um I have a friend from high school that was looking at going to a college up in North Dakota 
but she'll remain nameless. Um, but she was also wanting to be on the worship team there. And do you have to know about that this friend of mine from high school like put out two different CDs during high school? Like, oh wow, she is a to this day is just a fantastic singer. But what happened was she got to this Bible college that she'll again remain nameless, and the worship team was all speaking in tongues. My friend from high school is very much not that way. Mm -hmm. She does not have that charismatic gift. And basically what happened was that she was not going to be allowed to be on praise team until she developed the gift of tongues. So can you, maybe to the, to the guy that doesn't understand it, maybe I'm just a little slow. Sure. Like what is the gift of, like, like explain that. Like what okay. is that? Basically the gift of tongues is the spiritual manifestation where you are able to speak in a spiritual language. And to those outside, it can sound like gibberish. But yet, those that have that gift are speaking a God language, like the, a language that God is giving them. That is fascinating. Yeah. The other side of the gift of tongues um, is that some believe that they are given the ability to speak other worldly languages to communicate when communication might not be possible. That is absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. yep. Not anything I've ever been around before. Yeah, I have a friend from seminary who believes that one of her spiritual gifts is this other type of tongues because she was in a situation where no one spoke the language and yet it was cool because they understood each other. And she believes that she was communicating in languages that were not languages she knew. So back to Corinth. Because this division was so fierce and because it was so intense, that's why Paul has to give them these words of love. Sure. To say that love, the, the love of God, the love that God has shown us, agape love, doesn't act like this. Mm -hmm. Rather, love is patient. Love, love doesn't get frustrated with one another because, you know, those that have the gifts and those that don't have the gifts, if you're one of those that doesn't have the gifts, you're going to get real sick of people real fast. Absolutely. But the love of God is patient. And if you're one of those that has the, the, the more charismatic gifts and you're thinking, well, gosh, why can't they just get on board? You're going to get sick of people real, real, real fast too. So you need a love that is patient. And you need a love that is kind because they're not being very kind to one another at that moment. And like, you know, so you need a love that can endure and a love that doesn't keep record of wrong. Like this is why Paul says these 15 things about the nature of love it's all born out of all of these conflicts. Like, mm -hmm. This is the way that the love of God operates. And if you're not, then you're not showing the love of God. And that's a problem. So strive for the greater gifts. Mm -hmm. The greater gifts of faith and hope. And the greatest of these is love. So let's talk about some of those 15, yeah. those 15 things. In the, what I would call the middle. Sure. He talks about love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. That mm -hmm. section, like, what does he mean by that? Because that, I don't quite understand that. Basically, what Paul is trying to tell the church is that, you know, kind of, again, that, that idea of, you know, <laughs> that love should be the one that guides our actions. And that how they're treating one another is not that. And so if it's not that, then what is it? It is bearing all things. It is that love will not stop, basically. And that they are called to this type, type of a love. That even if they're at each other's throats, because those divisions aren't just going to magically go away over, over, overnight mm -hmm. because Paul right. says to love one another. And so God's love is big enough to get you through this rough patch, this rough season, this, this way you're treating one another until you strive for the greater gifts and until those, great, and until those strivings pay off. You know, the love of God will carry you through those things, through those hard times. Um, you know, bears all things, endures all things, believes all things. Like, the, when, I mean, again, these divisions are so, so vitriolic. And like, you know, I'm sure that there were things that were not true being said. There just had to have been. You know, things to justify our beliefs, or just to justify their beliefs, to justify their actions. And says, so no, Paul says, no, we rejoice in the truth. The love of God rejoices in the truth. Not in this falsehoods, it rejoices in the truth. So tell mm -hmm. the truth. If you have to deal with the fact that you are an elitist, deal with it. 
mm-hmm. and seek forgiveness and show love in the midst of it. Let's get into a little bit of practical application, like let's say in the church, sure. when we do have people with different skill sets. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we, as a church body, mm-hmm. identify and utilize all of the different gifts that we have in this church? Sure. Um, so identification is a very important thing. There are all kinds of spiritual gift inventories to take. Like, you know, have you ever taken a spiritual gifts test before? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. There are things in the world called spiritual gifts tests. Um, mm-hmm. They are, you know, there are some out there that are better than others, but they are all a, a, a little bit of a matter of you, you get it, you get out of them what you put into them. Mm-hmm. Getting the question openly and honestly and prayerfully and saying, God, is this really true of me? Is it, is it okay mm-hmm. if this is really true of me? And then putting that down as your answer. And then, you know, you do the math and you do the things and your, your results lift off, lift, list off for you four or five spiritual gifts. Sure. Like my spiritual gifts are around communication, around teaching, around shepherding, around leadership. Those are, you know, kind of where my spiritual gifts lie. And music is kind of mm. an outlier. Yeah. So that's one thing that can, that, that can be done. Um, another thing is just to, you know, to, to, to be mindful and, and be aware of those around you. Yeah. And, you know, I see this person and they do this and they seem to really enjoy doing this. So that indicates to me that they may have the spiritual gift of administration mm-hmm. or that, you know, they, they want to do this and be involved in this. So they might have the spiritual gift of hospitality, you know, or like, or I see, you know, guy, you know, if you ask them to share a thought, they'll, you know, <laughs> freeze up but if you ask them to swing a hammer at something they're gonna be right there right you know those are and like i think i think that there's a spiritual gift of swinging a hammer yeah. i think there's a lot of truth to that maybe that's because that's one of my mm. gifts is working with my hands and right. stuff like that yep yep but i think yeah. identifying gifts in any walk of you know in 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 your occupation in, you know and what you're doing mm-hmm. identifying everyone else's gifts like when you're because everything you're working as a team you're always striving for a common goal. You're right. working as a team in most in most cases. Yep. And if you can identify people that have different gifts than you and get mm-hmm. them on your team, yes. Your your whatever you're striving for is going to go a whole lot better. Yes. Where others might be really detailed oriented and mm-hmm. really are task oriented or something like that, where right. others are big picture thinkers and that kind of thing. Yes. You need all of those people to yes. work together. Yep. In the same sense, you need all those people in the church to work together in that way. Absolutely. Find these people to work on a project together mm-hmm. in the church or whatever that might be. Yep. But I think that's important to be able to identify those things. It is, yes. Uh, then I think the other part of it is that, you know, once we see a gift in someone to affirm that mm-hmm. in them, I think can be a really powerful step. Like I would not be who I am. I would not be where I am if there had not been certain people along the way that have, have that would have affirmed my gifts for ministry. Absolutely. You know? Right before my grandparents passed away, probably the last time they heard me sing in church, mm. um, sang a song, whatever, I, came, I could not tell you what the song is sure. today. Um, but afterwards, we had gone to my brother's and had lunch with all my siblings and my parents. And, you know, so that, that family, my grandparents were there. Yeah. And my grandmother went up to my, because growing up, I liked to sing. My brothers would always pick on me because only girls sing, of course. Sure. Um, and my grandmother went up to my brothers afterwards and shook her finger at them and said, how dare you make fun of him growing up because of how apparently how well I sang in church that Sunday. And so that moment of that information from my grandmother yeah. meant a lot to me mm-hmm. um, and has allowed me to keep singing, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. That's so awesome. That's pretty cool. What's next week? Yeah, so... Uh, next week is the continuation of the sermon series, uh, Love Lessons from a Loveless Church. Um, and with the love lesson that we're going to be talking about is the fact that love never ends. Um, there was a belief in the Corinthian church among some people. Uh, they didn't doubt the resurrection of Jesus because Jesus is the literal son of God, but they did doubt the resurrection of other believers. Paul has to correct this, and he corrects this by looping it back into the love that God had for us by sending Jesus. And basically, he said to the church that you can't believe partially in the resurrection. You believe fully in the resurrection or not at all. If you don't believe in the resurrection of fellow believers, you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the love that I just said endures, dies. Mm -hmm. 
and know Jesus is raised. Your friends that have fallen asleep in faith are raised. The resurrection is real, and it is because of the love of God defeating sin in the death of Jesus Christ and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's the love lesson that we're going to be digging into is on the resurrection um, and the fact that God's love endures even when we don't think it's feasibly possible. Hmm. Well, that sounds great. Yeah. Thanks for joining us this week on the Cut for Time podcast. Join us again next week in church at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary or on Facebook. Uh, or again back here for the Cut for Time podcast next week. Thanks for listening to our Cut for Time conversation. Join us for worship in person or on Facebook Live Sundays at 10 o'clock Central Time. And now go in peace and serve the Lord.